für den Donbass, der zur Geisel in einem viel größeren geopolitischen Machtspiel geworden ist. Die Ukraine und die ganze ukrainische Gesellschaft verdient und braucht unsere Solidarität. In 2014, Neo-Nazis came to power in Ukraine. I'll just leave it like that. And another one in this regard from the past. During the World War II, Ukrainians collaborated with the Nazis. I think it's better to leave it to the historians. And at the same time, not forget about at least 8 million of my countrymen, 2.5 million soldiers and 5.5 million civilians who were killed in that war, making together with those sent to concentration camps, deported uh, and evacuated a total of at least 14 million victims. That was 40 to 44 percent of all losses in the Soviet times, in the Soviet Union, in that war, more than Russia had. But then we hear we were just Nazi accomplices. Then another one, Crimea always belonged to Russia. The truth is, Crimea became part of the Russian Empire in 1783 and stayed there until 1954. So that's less than 200 years. Before that, it was for almost 350 years, heart of the Crimean state called Hanate, ruled by Crimean Tatars who are indigent people of the peninsula. And before that, when there was no Russia on the world map at all, Scythian, ancient Greek, and Roman, as well as many other various chapters in its history. Amazing. Our guests here from Ukraine will be introduced later. I would just like to mention Andrei Kurkov, the famous Ukrainian writer. We are honored to have you here. Unfortunately, I forgot your book. I wanted to get your signature today. <laughs> we have to do that another time. Uh, in your books, we see characters who I think are very much uh, objects of history and uh, people who are disoriented by the forces that they don't understand. And I think it paints a picture of a Soviet or post-Soviet society and a society uh, where trust and confidence is in very short supply. And I think it's excellent you're here with us today. And I think it was a little bit the idea behind the event today to uh, engage as a German audience with Ukrainians who have an experience in this that we are afraid of, but an experience that is much more extreme. Um, I think for us it's also an interesting status update, if you want, on what's going on in Ukraine these days. We do have many events on Ukraine and Germany, but on these particular subjects I think we haven't spoken here for, for quite a while. So when I saw that, uh, I understood that uh, looks like my media business will totally it will be a total disaster if I will not do something about it. So I went to National uh, TV and Radio Council. At that time, it was only one person out of eight or other run away with Yanukovych. Uh, and they asked them, like, looks like you need a help. Uh, do you need monitoring, maybe, to monitor Russian channels? Or maybe you need some lawyers? Um, and actually, in three weeks' time, we were, it was the first winning court against Russian channels uh, when we proved this fake news and uh, it was not final winning but it was a uh, like intermediate winning when before the final court they will be blocked so it was first court for four russian tv channels which was blocked which was quite easy because at that time they really uh, create very easy uh, dissolving fakes uh, given the resources the russians have given the attention they're devoting to this that it's a losing war and that you're going to have to find other ways to address this problem. And just one, one other point that I forgot to mention before, uh, which is very important, is that uh, this entire event is going to be recorded. There's going to be an audio recording and there are photographers walking around as well, just so that everybody in the audience is, is aware of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to, to talk about this topic because uh, Stop Fake, as one of the civil society initiatives, is an uh, example when uh, uh, journalists and uh, uh, those people who want to protect the profession from influence of disinformation and propaganda combine their efforts to 
stop those efforts. And uh, we really f we've been thinking about the question you, you, you mentioned. That, that does it really helpful to do that? What the, the efficiency of that? And we do believe that that was the right moment and the right decision. At that moment when we started Stop Fakes three and a half years ago, nobody believed that this is what we need to do. And uh, nobody was paying much attention and people have been saying that, yeah, that's probably a nice idea, but this is a unique problem for Ukraine because of the war Russia is conducting against Ukraine. And that depends. That depends on how we look at this. And uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for being here and for uh, coming to, to listen to these issues. Because um, I usually start with a phrase that it's not about Ukraine now, and actually it never been about Ukraine. It's about the uh, values we share and try to preserve. It's about the democracy basement that we all working on and we all we all trying to develop. Uh, answering the question on the uh, changes and uh, uh, some kind of a progress, uh, first of all, uh, we can start from the, some kind of theoretical question about the uh, uh, title Old Lies New Approach. You know, um, uh, I spent my lunch time today to visit the German Spy Museum, very, very interesting place uh, for me in particular. And, uh, you know, I've noticed that uh, the, the museum starts with the stories from the um, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, uh, China, and uh, it's uh, the uh, centuries and th thousands of years ago. And uh, then it goes to the uh, James Bond stories and uh, uh, the new era of uh, uh, Cold War. And for the centuries and thousands of years, nothing is changing. Nothing is changing in approaches, in ideas, in trying to um, attack people, trying to fool them, and all the and all this stuff. So actually, Ukraine, and you pose the question to yourself, especially well, me as a statesman, as a server, as a civil servant, what do you have done to stop the disinformation activity towards Ukraine? And when the answer is, well, we've done roundtables, conferences, discussions, we've made uh, studies, we've made huge and big reports about trolls, dissemination of, uh, and uh, uh, different, you know, like talking the talks, uh, then uh, there's very uncomfortable feeling inside that it, it, uh, it wasn't effective, it wasn't sufficient. So the progress is on the place. And it's absolutely obvious. But unfortunately, we're still working on the idea that we have to do more to preserve democracy. We have to do more just to think about the threats that are being posed to the uh, values that uh, are in the basement of the democratic development. So what's, what's behind this strategy? I still don't understand why you're throwing out uh, the Spanish journalists first. Well, uh, let's go then to the uh, question about the journalists and the exclusion of the journalists. Uh, I would be straight with you, uh, yes, on the uh, question of the uh, uh, deportation of Spanish journalists. Minister of Information Policy sent a request to the uh, security service asking about motivation and giving more information about this. Me personally, I went to their social profiles and uh, articles that they put uh, uh, in the media, and I've seen the facts that were totally wrong. Uh, that doesn't say me that, uh, and I'm not the, the person who may, who, who, who may do the law enforcement to the journalist. But um, as to an audition and as to, to some kind of expert in the information field, to the extent of conducting war, and this was basically what the court decided, so the propaganda was absolutely instrumental to the conduct of the war. And this is basically what guides us through this discussion, what is a danger for national security and what is not. And it's not regulated inside Ukraine, it's regulated outside of Ukraine because we take the decision and use it. Right, in, in Ukraine it's a success story and uh, progress. And uh, when I accompanied uh, Minister Gabriel uh, at his trip in March of this year, uh, we, of course, uh, included in his program a discussion uh, with uh, representatives of uh, civil society, of Ukrainian civil society, and uh, all in all, uh, Minister Gabriel was very impressed with the vibrancy um, 
uh, of the discussion uh, with the civil society representatives. And uh, good evening. I'm pleased to be here again. Notice that I've not been here since you were my time. And I extremely like the topic which we are discussing. And reflecting on the first panel, I know the answer how to defeat Putin. <laughs> Success in Ukraine is the only way to collapse his regime. Not creating anti, anti, anti. We will never have more money and resources. But if we would make Ukraine really successful case of changing authoritarian country with huge corruption, with kind of Putin's mechanism everywhere into successful, we should not bother how and what to say to Russian people. They will know next day and Putin is dead. It's easier to say, but it is doable. And I wanted to start from this. What should we focus at to make this doable quicker in time? Uh, in my life, I just happened to be in different, totally different position like Tatiana said. Uh, in, in 26 years of independence, roughly, I spent 50% in governmental position and moved into civil sector. Tatiana didn't want to go into government. I had no choice because I was not a member of the party. I'm not a businessman, but I'm hyperactive. And I know and I'm really... I, I, I'm, I'm really... Uh, can't find a good word, polite word. Not polite, pissed off by what happened. And is very much surprised that this water somewhere in this pit. If you don't first disinfect, change the body, make sure there are no big holes, how you can provide financial aid? You know the answer I'm hearing? Well, we'll do that when you are candidate country. And then I can imagine what European taxpayers should hear. If you spend billions of financial aid on Ukraine, not bothering of creating institutions which would prevent government from misusing. Moreover, EU has very strong ally in civil society. Any issue you discuss, you can always find very reliable assistance here. We have an important to do with Heinrich Stiftung in 1993. Uh, I, I, I... 93, yes, and thanks to Heinrich Stiftung, I met Lev Kopenev and we became friends and I stayed in London Royce for five months with his widow. Uh, and that was the first time I uh, was uh, trying to understand Germany. I think by now I understand Germany. Some of us are still trying, so... I'm yes, trying. I know, yes. Uh, and now uh, to the civil society. Uh, it's not easy to talk after hyperactive uh, but uh, when I'm asked what is the difference between uh, Russians and Ukrainians, I often say that uh, uh, Russians have in their head one and the same image of great Russia and one and the same love for the Russian Tsar until he is making them unhappy, they kill him and then they love the next Tsar. Ukraine, uh, historically, based on the anarchic metrics. Everyone has his own picture of Ukraine in his head and wants to build it, but outside his head. And uh, I have the same sort of now feeling that I have completely different civil society in Ukraine in my head than in Oleg Trubachuk's. Because, I mean, my civil society is not running across the field, is not asking for my progress. Uh, okay. But uh, anyway, I mean, five-star civil society is a beautiful image. As a writer, I can give you five out of five, yes. But uh, I think we are talking about uh, only one part of civil society because for me, civil society is much bigger than those who are hyperactive and are in touch with Brussels and are involved in economical reforms or in attempts to change politics in the country. Uh, uh, started by Americans of Ukrainian descent and some Belgians and Swiss who came and explained to Ukrainians that they should also care about the animals. But there are lots of things you have to care in Ukraine because the government doesn't care and or because there is no service for this. Including political animals. Uh, well, those can look after themselves themselves, yeah. But uh, uh, what I'm worried about, I mean, we have uh, this strong civil society 
uh, in both sense, I mean, militant, which deals with the front, with the integrity of the country, and civic, civil society, which deals with daily problems. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are talking always now only about this militant part. Great. From your perspective as an academic, where, where has this process gone wrong in terms of the civil society really uh, creating, helping to create effective institutions in the country? Yeah, thank you. Thanks also for inviting me. Uh, I try to theorize a little bit uh, what we've heard about civil society in Ukraine, about its strength, about its problems, and uh, of course I will try to answer your question. And exactly when I was uh, invited to this panel, um, and I read the, the title of our panel, I got this, uh, this idea as well about the success stories, and I was missing a question mark. So as a researcher, I'm used to see question marks everywhere, and this is why, for my inner satisfaction, I put a question mark on these success stories. Um, because Ukrainian civil society is an, is an ambivalent beast, let's, uh, let's say like that. Um, it is strong and it is weak at the same time. It is strong in that sense that um, since decades, um, Ukrainian civil society is one of the most active and the most vibrant in the eastern, uh, in, in central and eastern Europe. Already in the uh, USSR times, so or during these times, for example, the dissident movement in the USSR was mainly very strong in the Baltic states and in Ukraine. Among all the political prisoners uh, who were in prison in the USSR, uh, Ukrainians were, much, were, were very obviously um, more represented than dissidents and people and political prisoners from any other Soviet rep republic. So there is a certain strength of the Ukrainian civil society since decades, and since decades civil society in Ukraine is used to bring people to the streets, to organize campaigns, to be very active in um, starting revolutions, in starting campaigns. I mean, you are all pretty much aware about the, the movements during the 80s, for example, the Donbass minor strikes, then we had the, the Granite Revolution in 1990, 1991. The number of, of um, the, the share of people from Ukraine who are engaging in volunteer organizations and initiatives is um, can be counted as 13%. So 13% of the Ukrainian population uh, is active in volunteer organizations and initiatives. Uh, this was a number for 2014 or 15, I think. This is a high share, that's not bad. 